Greetings and welcome back. We are in Junior English and continuing our conversation with Emily Dickinson and I'm on page 415 of your hymnal. And we're going to now look at one of the more remarkable offerings that Dickinson has for us. The brain is wider than the sky. Now this poem is so unbelievably simple and yet as many readers have pointed out, so remarkably complex. What she's trying to say will become for us, at times, very difficult, at level one even, to put into words. As we read, let's just try and play the game at level one of what she's saying. Of course, already I hope that you're beginning to develop an eye at level 2B. So, for example, when you look down on the page, notice immediately on 415, we've got three stanzas, each stanza of four lines, notice you've got a nice balance there between the three. We sometimes will use the term tripartite, which means three parts. Notice on the effacing page, 414, we've got the same gig all over again, right? Where Dickinson is playing a tripartite stanza breakdown game. Now that's significant for us at level one, because what we'll maybe do is under level one write a capital A, skip a couple of lines, capital B, skip a couple of lines, capital C, Right? And then as we hit these stanzas, we'll try to reduce the stanza down to a single line. What is it that she says? Now why would I do something like that? Because later on, several days, maybe even weeks later, if I had to take an exam where I got to answer questions over this poem, it's a lot easier for me to review this poem, right, from my annotations to get me ready for the exam. The brain is wider than the sky, basically at level one she says A, B, C, see how that works? Then. A little bit of work at two and three, levels two and three, can allow us to maybe remember something about this poem. Let's take a look and just read the poem, and then we'll and then we'll do a process of exegesis. And again, at two B already, I'm sure you're already writing this down. The number of dashes, as we mentioned before, with Emily Dickinson's work, lots of dashes there. Like she's trying to figure out what she's going to say, and then she has to pause for a second to figure it out, come up with an idea. We might say, the brain is wider than the sky. Let's go ahead and read it together on 415. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Now we should point out right away that Dickinson is definitely playing some intentional games here. Notice with sound, we've got a little bit of rhyme happening, don't we, right? But let's talk through this really quickly in regards to stanza breakdown at level one. And then of course we'll do some work as well at 2A. Notice the first lines. The brain is wider than the sky. Go ahead and jot down at level one what you think that line means. Because quite frankly, if I were to take right now your brain out of your skull and hold it up to the sky, which one would we say is bigger? This is a, this is a it gets dark at night obvious question, right? We would say obviously the sky is a whole lot bigger than your brain. But notice what Dickinson says, the brain is wider than the sky. So right away, you've got kind of a strange paradox here. She says that your brain is larger than the sky. Which begs a really interesting question. How could she say something like that? Your brain is larger than the sky, and then all of a sudden it will hit you. Oh, wait a minute. She uses the B word, brain, but she could easily be meaning the M word. See if you could guess what word I'm talking about. Her mind. You got it. That's exactly right. So she uses the B word brain to reference the M word mind. And now we're back to a game we were playing earlier with an earlier poem where we talked about soul and I asked you, well, where is your soul? And then I asked you, is it in your brain? Well, no. Can you have a, can you have a soul without a brain? Well, no. Now, brain and mind. Well, it's funny how we use language. We often don't think about the meaning of those words. Where is your mind? You know, moms will sometimes ask this to stupid sons. Did you lose your ever-loving mind? Well, what does that mean? As if 
boys of 13 ever have minds to begin with. But what does it mean, your mind? Like, what, where is your mind? Well, this is a very interesting question. And all of a sudden, we realize we've got words that kind of can interchange with each other, right? So, for example, mind can interchange with spirit or soul. Or, as we were talking earlier in an earlier lecture with Emerson, we can just use the word energy, right? Now, what is it about your mind that could make your mind wider than the sky? Well, notice she continues. If you put both mind and or brain and sky together side by side, notice she says, the one, the other, will contain with ease and you beside. Now, wait a minute. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking about that I word. Our, if I got any artists in the house, you know the word I'm talking about. You'll remember that Einstein once when he was complimented on being so smart, he said it. Imagine, imagination is more important than knowledge. Well, look, what an interesting line. You might write that down at 3A. That's an interesting line. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination? What does that term even mean? There are uh, people today who critique schools harshly, and they say, here's what's wrong with schools. Schools destroy a student's imagination. Watch children at the age of five and six, and they have tremendously gifted imaginations. Come back and visit them when they're 16, and they've turned into kind of like zombies that just kind of walk school halls and do what they're told and never ask any more questions. How many more days till we got to get out of this thing called school? And then we're going to get a job. And then we're going to raise a family. And where did the imagination go? Gone. Well, what is imagination? See, we use the term. Now I'm going to ask you to define it. Can you define what it means to use your imagination? Well, the C word is going to have a lot to do with imagination, huh? We know the C word here, creativity, right? To create stuff, right? To make stuff up. Creativity, imagination. And now all of a sudden we start to get a picture into what it is that Dickinson is saying. She will make the argument that when your brain is working, we'll call that mind, along with Stephen Baker. When your brain is working, we'll call that mind, and your mind can contain the sky. Whoa. Well, now that's interesting. How can your mind contain the sky? Well, now we're going to use our I word. This is back to an earlier lecture that we gave on Emerson. You'll remember where we had two boxes on a whiteboard. In the first box, above the first box, we had the word physical, correct? And then above the second box, we had the word concept or ideas. So, for example, we could talk about a beautiful woman in the first box or a beautiful body in the first box, and then we could talk about the concept beauty in the second box. The mind sees the stuff of the second box. We even sometimes call it the mind's eye. And the mind has the capacity to imagine things larger than the sky. And for Dickinson then, an exceptional gift. An exceptional gift. It is one of the oldest questions. What's the difference between you and your dog, if you own a dog, or a cat, or whatever? Many years ago, I had a student named Davis, and we were sitting in class, and I just said it out loud. What's the difference between Davis and his dog? Because I knew he had a dog, and I knew he liked the dog. And uh, somebody in class shouted back, not much. And I said, well, wait a minute. we got to talk about this for a second. What is the difference between you and a dog? It's a very interesting question. Because if you start breaking it down, that dog and you have pretty much all the same kinds of physical organs. That dog has a brain. That dog has a heart. That dog's got blood that pulses through his veins. Dude, what is the difference between you and a dog? And I remember once having this conversation with a group of students, and I wouldn't let them off the hook. I kept asking, I want you to tell me what is the real difference between the two. Don't tell me you got language and the dog doesn't. We know that's not true. Don't tell me that we don't have that we have emotions and the dog doesn't. You know that's not true. All you gotta do is just some some pet owner's gonna look at a dog and it, you know, shows emotion, contriteness, humility, anger, rage. Whoa. Now all of a sudden I can even tell by the looks on some of your faces. Well, that's a very interesting question. What is the difference between you and a dog? Hmm. Can you jot down in your notes 
One difference that you can identify that's a real difference between you and a dog. Hmm. Well, a dog doesn't have to write down stuff like annotations. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're getting close to understanding something when we say it that way. This is the way Aristotle said it, the great Greek philosopher. He said, both you and a dog can look at a sunset, but only one of you can appreciate the sunset. Hmm. Now that's an interesting argument. Emily Dickinson will agree. What makes humans so remarkable is that mind housed in that brain of yours that can do all these amazing things with your imagination. Way bigger than the sky. Look at the next stanza. The brain is deeper than the sea. Now you get it. Now you get it, don't you? See how the you unload, you unpack that first stanza, and then all of a sudden the second stanza starts to make all kinds of sense. In other words, as high as the sky is, as deep as the ocean of the sea is, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb. In other words, the, the mind can capture in a split second the sea and hold it here, right? And that capacity, almost like a sponge, it's an interesting word. This is an interesting phrase, and I recommend you write it down to see if you actually agree with it or not. She says the brain or the mind is like a sponge that will absorb the water from the bucket. See, that's a really interesting question. Unless you're on some serious dope, you're probably attending fairly well to what I'm saying right now, right? But the question is, in 20 years, will you still remember anything of what I'm saying right now? See, right? Because here's the deal. Some of you will report that you know that you were in seventh grade. You know it. You've even seen pictures of it. But for the life of you, you can't hardly remember anything that happened in seventh grade in regards to things you were supposed to learn. So where did all that stuff go? It was in your brain, but where did it go? Is your brain like a sponge that just kind of sucks up information so that you've got it? Is that how it works for you? And why is it, for example, that I could say certain things from your past in our time together in class that you'll be able to remember, but then I can, you know, say other things and you'll be like, other students may go, oh yeah, I remember that. And you'll, you'll go, I don't remember him saying that at all. Well, where were you? No, I was here. Well, where were you? You mean, where was my mind? That's what you really mean to ask me, where was my mind? Um, that's a really interesting question, which begs the penultimate question, how do you remember anything? How does your mind remember things? And why is it that, for example, I can forget everything, but I can remember one moment that I had with another person so long ago? I can remember everything about that experience. Why is that? Why is it that I have certain abilities to remember some things? In other words, my mind does seem to work like a sponge sometimes. But at other times, it's like, dude, I can't get anything in there anymore. The final stanza will ask a very interesting question. And notice we're going to get to the G word, God, aren't we? The mind is just the weight of God. For half them pound for pound, they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Now, a lot has been written and made of this final stanza. What argument is Dickinson making here? For example, is she talking about the great Disney film Pinocchio where we're talking about that thing called your cricket conscience, right? Remember, Gemini Cricket's job is to remind the unhuman or slightly human Pinocchio what's right and what's wrong. So for example, you and three buddies go into the grocery store to pick up a pack of gum and not buy it. The other two seem to have no problem with doing this. It's you that seems to have the problem. And as you walk in, your heart begins to beat harder. And you start to kind of look around at people like they're somehow looking at you. You get paranoid. And then as you see the other two reaching for the pack of gum, you start to tremble a little bit. Why is that? Why is that? Where did that come from? Dickinson says, 
That's what makes the mind, in her words, the brain, so remarkable. Your conscience, the thing that tells you what's right and what's wrong, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. There are others who will identify in this final stanza Emily Dickinson's view of God as being not some entity that sits outside of the human, but rather something inside of the human. Again, as I say, this, this debate can go on and on. All right, let's work really quickly now on an annotation. 2A. Well, what do, you, what do you think she says about the mind or the brain? Can you jot down one or two lines in your own words? Remember, we're not asking what she says in 2A. We're asking, can you put it in your own words? Major message, major theme about the importance of mind. At 2B, we've already made several observations, right? Notice the rhythm as well. See, I can, I can read it this way. The brain is wider than the sky. Or put them side by side. See, I can read it that way. Or I can slow it down. Listen to the way I slow it down and read it. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side. The one the other will contain with ease and you decide. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. That's what we would call a, 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 an iambic foot. Ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-bum. On stress, stress. Ba-bum, ba-bum. Notice she does that through the entire poem. Now, is that random? Is that accidental? Or what do you think? Intentional. See, we kind of have a sense. Probably a little bit intentional. We've also got, of course, some rhyming going on, don't we? Sky rhyming with beside. C, um, it, it doesn't rhyme with do. So, see, you should notice she's playing games. She's playing games, but not consistently. Let's jump to 3A really quickly. What is for you your greatest example of a movie about a creative person? About a person who uses his or her imagination? What's your favorite movie of that? And of course, one of the most famous films in the Academy of, you know, the Academy Awards is of course Russell Crowe's classic film, Beautiful Mind, which played the game of questions about artists. See, I love to hang out with artists. I will ask them, for example, let me get this straight. I'm pointing at a work of art on our, on our wall over there. Let me get this straight. That started as all white space. Yeah. Canvas. Yeah. But now there's no white space other than the intentional white paint on it. The rest of it is other colors. Right. That canvas was completely covered with an artist's fingertip. He painted the entire canvas with his fingertip, not a brush. He would dip the finger into paint and paint it. That, that whole thing is finger painted. Question, why did you pick the colors that you picked? And how did you know where to start? Did you start at one of the corners? Did you start in the middle? How did you know? Did you have some picture in your mind? Did you have some picture that was sitting next to you that said, this is what I want it to look like? I love to ask a question like that to an artist because often an artist will say, man, I can't explain it. I don't know. If I have artists in here, you'll know what I'm talking about. I don't know how I did it. I just know it was part of the creative process. What is for you the movie that best celebrates that? What is for you the movie where the creative mind is sometimes not understood? Maybe, for example, an individual wants to be creative, wants to be an artist, wants to be a musician, and not very accepted sometimes, not understood at all. Maybe the adults in his or her life are saying, no, that's a dumb idea, way dumb idea. And the person has to overcome a lot of obstacles to produce. I've already mentioned Plato's Phaedo, a classic dialogue about the soul. And the idea of the mind comes nicely with the soul. Right? And then finally, let's go to 3B. What are your thoughts about the imagination. Let me ask a series of questions. You can decide. Some of these questions are not easy to answer because a lot of times they make my students go, ooh, I don't like to accept what he just said might be true. Do you still have an imagination or has school killed it? The great Mark Twain said, my schooling keeps getting in the way of my education. What an interesting idea. Is school the place for you where your imagination, like a sponge, gets new life? Or would you say right now about your imagination, if it's like a sponge, it's like a dry sponge? You ever picked up a dry sponge? It's hard as rock, right? It's hard as rock. 
you drop it into water and it gets nice and soft and pliable again, right? What would you say about your own imagination? What would you say about your past and now your present? And why do you think it is the case so often that students lose their creativity in school? If you could change school to make it more conducive to creating creativity, what would you do? What would be the one thing that you would change? Would it be mandatory attendance? There have been students who said that. If students at Orland High School could just come to school on the days they wanted to, and they could show up to hear the teachers that they wanted to hear, their imaginations would all come back. They would not sit at home alone forever. Sooner or later, they would find their way back. It might be several months. And then after a while, they would be, you know what? Probably school is a place where I need to be, but on my terms. And then they would show up. But they would only show up with the teachers who could actually move their imagination. Make them enjoy the process of creating. What are your thoughts on an idea like that? Of course, for some of us, we're frightened by the project of creativity. We take an art class, and the canvas is all white. And the instructor says you have three weeks, fill it up with paint. And for some of us, we just freak out at a project like that. Dude, I got no idea. What am I so I got no help, I need help, teacher, I need help. What do you mean you need help? Just create. Yeah, I don't know how to create. What do you mean you don't know how to create? Just create. Go. Do it. Yeah, I don't I don't know how to do that. Others of us are like, yes, that's called heaven. If I could just have that all day long, that would just be for me heaven. Are we born like the color of our eyes with that ability to create? Or are artists actually quite, are they a special group? Are they kind of different? Hmm. As we think then about the idea of your mind, can you give yourself a score of one to five? Five being a mind that is active and working and loving to create, and one being a mind that's ostensibly dead. It's like a zombie. What would you give yourself? Now, the second question is going to be the more intriguing one. What would your teachers give to you? What would the people in your life who are adults give to you? What would they say about your creativity? Would they claim that you are a very creative person? Or would they say, yeah, now pretty much dead? Of course, one of the most famous things ever said in parent-teacher conversations with adults of, of, of young people is, your son or daughter has a lot of potential. Some of you probably heard this has a lot of potential, but doesn't work up to potential. What does the word potential mean? Well, Emily Dickinson would say mind, imagination, creativity. But for some of us, maybe we don't feel like our minds do much anymore at all. Can you change that? For some of us, monkey mind is our problem, that mind that jumps all over the place and can never concentrate or focus on one thing. How to learn how to do that, that's always an interesting question as well. Well, there you go. The brain is wider than the sky, an introduction to Dickinson's view of mind.